Godherja is the most ambitious project to hit the CK3 modding scene when we consider the depth of its lore and planned mechanics. That is why in this video, I will be breaking down the 70-ish page lore primer into an easily digestible video for you to either explore the lore further, or so you can quickly understand the basics without having to dedicate time to reading what is essentially a novella's worth of information, although it is quite good, just FYI. But first, some basics. Godherja's lore was primarily written by J, or Lonely Knight S, the creator of mods, an Assyrian tale for CK2, and The New Order, The Last Days of Europe for Hearts of Iron 4, but also by the Godherja team, who, in addition to J, openly contribute to the mod's lore and assisted me with some additional resources while making this video. Thank you guys once again. Godherja is inspired by works like A Song of Ice and Fire, Dragon Age Origins, Heroes of Might and Magic, Age of Wonders, and the Elder Scrolls, as well as using historical empires for influence like the Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Holy Roman Empire. Now, it's important to keep in mind that while the primer is an extensive document, it does not in any way contain the entirety of the mod's lore. Think of it like the Silmarillion's section on the War of the Ring, which the Lord of the Ring covers more in depth. Yes, it will give you an overview and a general understanding of that period of time, but to know all of it and to truly understand it, you'd have to go deeper into the Reddit posts and lore discussions on the Discord. For the sake of this video, I'll be summarizing each section as it appears in the primer to make it easier to either follow along or to get a feel for how it's laid out. These three sections occur chronologically from beginning of time to the game start date of 1254 IS. I will provide access to my notes, i.e. this entire script, in the comments as a Google Doc so you can see the page number sourcing my information should you wish to go read this information for yourself. There will be some things left out if I ad-lib, but for the most part everything will be there. I'll also be providing a few links that expand on some sections of the primer which kind of glosses over some events that are pretty interesting, although not necessary for inclusion in this video necessarily. Those of you semi-familiar with God Herja probably recognize this guy on the right here. His name is Nick Anonius, which I will be using as a narration aid alongside a few other characters throughout this video. I'll also be using various figures and other things that I found th either through the mod or online. I figured I'd go with Nick Anonius though since he's sort of the poster child for the mod but I can't say I prefer him over someone like Senware for example but uh, we'll get to that later. Anyway I think that's enough preface for now so without further ado this is God Herja, the story of CK3's most ambitious mod by me Soul Tomato. I hope you enjoy. As with so many stories, Godherja's lore begins with nothing, an infinite void of darkness. Then came the gods. Although conventionally speaking, they were more like forces of will, concepts, laws of reality, and existence personified. They appeared like stars whose great forces shifted and brought forth reality. Of the gods, only one understood existence as we might. This was the creator of humanity, the first and only god to truly think, to exist, and to glean from the ether the principles of consciousness. This was Ersanon. Perhaps out of all beings known as gods, Ersanon is the only true god, for they are the only one humanity ever understood. For trillions of years, Ersanon simply existed, until finally they determined through the Herculean process of birthing all concepts of existence that they were alone, and through this loneliness created its concept, along with boredom, misery, confusion, fear, really all human emotions and our understanding of them stem from this unimaginable void of conceptual discovery. Eventually, Ersanon realized they could make things, manipulate the cosmos, and bend reality to their will. The order of events of the universe's filling are obviously unknown, but Ersanon had their hand in it, for they were the only god who could. Of this, we are certain. The order of its realization therefore matters less than what came next, that being the creation of our world, Eris. Around Eris, Ersanon formed a ball of light or a sun, and carved on the face of the, at the time, lifeless ball next to it, rivers, valleys, plants, and settled way lines of magic deep beneath the surface like the veins of a living being. For a time, this was good. But soon, Ersanon grew tired of the relative quiet of their plant spawn. So, they created more complex life. Though much like with the filling of the universe and the creation of Eris, the order of their evolution or spontaneous complexity is unknown. Regardless, eventually, humanity came into being. And so too did time. For the creations of Ersanon, plants and people alike, grew and died under the eons of their curious watch. At this time, the souls of these beings simply returned to Ersanon when leaving their corporeal form to be reused in new forms later, for they had no purpose or reason to keep them. Eventually, though, Ersanon wished to converse or be near their human creation and sent forth what can only be thought of as a slice of themselves in the form of a scarlet-robed and hooded figure with no face, towering above all and leaning upon a staff of pure 
darkness. To the initial shock of Ersanon, for they had no concept of it, the humans began to worship them as the father and mother of creation. Ersanon eventually grew to love them, as a parent would their child, despite not fully understanding their nature or their prayers and demands, one such demand being light to fill the impossibly dark nights, which Ersanon answered by creating the stars, pinpoints of light in an otherwise empty sky, and giving Eris its moon, Erovar. Humanity, as we have always done, grew, and our towns eventually formed empires. Erisonon, understanding and relishing now the power of worship and rule, constructed great magical towers over the underground way lines, which Erisonon could visit, and the minor rulers of men could live and work from. Those within who were deemed worthy were given magic, or a portion of Erisonon's divine blood. Thus, the first magi, the god kings of men, came into being. But alas, our ways eventually became too crude for our creator, and after a few eons they grew tired of humanity, our war our greed, and misuse of their divine magical gifts, so they decided to create beings more equal to themselves to converse with and to love. By this point, humanity had exploded, and in the centuries of their many empires, the Magi kings had propagated until many of even the lowest of humans had a portion of the creator's divine magical blood. At the center of the world, from their tower throne surrounded by a swirling archipelago of sea and land known by names like Artera Dexron or Atradikos and the Imperial Isles, Arsenon worked on what became known as their second project, or the Aelfir. The Aelfir were like men, if only in concept, for they were larger, stronger, had different hues of skin, could control magic with ease, and lived for untold years. Their only downfalls were that of their reproduction, which seemed to occur but only once per female every hundred to thousands of years, and that of their nature, which was cruel, vain, and hateful, malicious beyond anything humanity could ever conceive. These beings came to worship Ersanon, talk with them as the humans did, and perhaps on a slightly more even footing. But because of their cruel nature, the Aelfir enslaved and tore down the empires of men with their awesome gifts of magic and strength, until no human remained free, and all empires belonged to the Aelfir. Empires which turned humanity into little more than tools used to erect its monuments or fuel its religious rituals. By the millions, perhaps billions, humanity suffered and died for the amusement of the superior Aelfir. Though Ersanon wept for their first children and would occasionally answer their pleas, they felt closer to the Aelfir. Yet, due to their cruelty, they again grew indifferent and saw the Aelfir as a failure. Thus, Arsenon contented themselves with creating new lands, stars, plants, and animals to occupy their infinity. In time, through their desire to not only be like, but to be equal to their god, the Aelfir created great and terrible works. Flying ships, automatons infused with human souls, flying castles of magic to ascend and explore the cosmos, and grotesque living experiments using the combination of life found on the planet, some of which survive today as some of Eros' most ferocious beasts. Some say they even created a great and terrible magic, using the might of all their greatest magi to use against their creator should they ever try to stand against them and their indomitable progress. When Ersanon finally looked upon their creations again, they realized with disappointment that they had not made something equal to them, and thus began on their third and final project, a work made to surpass even the indomitable Aelfir. So Ersanon disappeared from Eros once again, and in the wake of their absence, man learned to watch the Aelfir to learn from them and themselves grow in power, taking and honing their technology, their magic, and their cruelty, hiding in the shadows and growing strong until at last, after centuries of secret and desperate preparation, the greatest of all collective human endeavors, the god Hersia, began. The God War began when humanity dared to drag the Aelfir emperors from their thrones and cut them to pieces in a millennia-spanning rage. Billions marched to their destruction, and though the Aelfir's magic and strength were superior, the hordes of humanity and their enhanced magic, which they could wield in greater numbers, eventually overcame them. And though almost all of humanity died in the trying, the Aelfir were cast down and their race removed from the earth. Though none now remember how long the conflict was, the results of its devastation were obvious. The world was in ruins, and humanity now wondered what Ersanon would do once they heard of the Aelfir's demise. Fearing Ersanon would erase them as a species, or perhaps turn back time to the moment just before the revolt had ever been planned and wipe out the seeds of dissidence before they could ever sprout, humanity's last great magi gathered together to form a terrible spell, perhaps the same the Aelfir had created long before. As Arsenon in their indifferent toiling looked back and saw the devastation of the preceding war and its, in their eyes, quick passing, they too saw this great spell and magic, but did nothing as humanity hurtled it towards them out of fear and desperation. Perhaps a god did not believe it could be destroyed. Perhaps they weren't. But the heavens were torn asunder, and Arsenon disappeared forever as the universe rose to answer 
or humanity's crime. All right, now I won't lie, this next section and those that follow are kind of dense. I'll try not to throw too much at you, because obviously this is an overview of what is already basically an overview, but I also want to avoid skipping over any major details, so just bear with me. If I'm putting it in here, it's probably good to know. Time will quickly begin narrowing down as we progress, so expect these summaries to become heavier and more focused as we go along. The cataclysm which followed Ersanon's death caused 9 out of every 10 humans to die in explosions of fire and blood, pretty much instantly. The magi faced with the discharge of the creator's magical energy hemorrhaged and died, or if they lived, found their powers all but erased. What magic remained in the world was dark and evil, dangerous to both caster and target. The continents shifted. Voids of infinite nothingness opened and closed, and everything down to the very concepts of sound and light were altered in the wave of change. From Arsenon's magical towers, which purged their magic deep into the earth, evil spirits and creatures formed from the souls of dead Elphir and humans. The land of Artera Dexron sank and shattered into thousands of small isles. But perhaps worst of all, the cycle of life and death was forever changed, with the souls of the dead trapped in a hellish infinity of Arsenon's dead mind, or left to wander the shell of Eris forever. Humanity would survive, if only just, with barely enough people to repopulate this new dark age of calamity. One thousand year ice and rainstorms followed plague, famine, drought, hundred foot seas, mile long magma rivers, and even the moon, Aelvir itself, changed to a sickly green hue in the wake of this devastating new unguided reality. But man as he does endured, and in the face of one thousand calamities and unknowable years evolved. When the dust finally settled, the memories of the time before were jumbled and largely forgotten including of Arsenon, and in their wake new cultures and religions formed in the ruins of the dead world and the old cities that littered it. In all corners of the world, from the Great Steppe, where men rediscovered horses and began gathering in large tribes, covering their features with masks to protect their visage from all but the gods, these would become known as the Olentics, to the mage-controlled empires who would quarrel and challenge one another for who was the most powerful, humanity spread. None were perhaps more important to the future of mankind, however, than the adversarians a term they themselves did not initially coin, but was coined for them by the scholars who would come later. The Aversarians were the remnants of those who remained loyal to the Aelfir, having been the guardsmen of one of their emperors who ruled from Ertera Dexron at the seat of Arsenon. Though time passed and they forgot why they served him, the Aversarians continued to revere the long-dead emperor, eventually naming him Ersodiax, Speaker of the Gods. This worship would branch off into new faiths, including the important Arsodiaxian faith, which believed in the sanctity and holy rite of slavery and cruelty. They and their cousin kid would spread and multiply, building great city-states called polis around the ruined isles of Artera Dexron. These polis eventually fell, which is explained on greatly in a reddit post which I will link in the document, and gave way to the Magi Kings, as in times of old, with a culture known as the Nicarian, named for the captain of the Aelfir Emperor's Guard standing at the top. These peoples would form a thousand-year-long empire, known as the Adversarian Autocrata, or Human, Imperium. The Aesodiaxians and the dragons which the Empire used to conquer the world would be slain in the Great Civil War, which again is expanded on in that Reddit post I mentioned a little while ago. This would birth the Aversarian Agiocrata, or Humanity's Faith, which held that the Aversarian rulers were descended from a godly figure known as the Purist, and their followers the First Men, a pretext to give power to the Autocratiers, the Emperors of Aversaria, and establish themselves as living gods, as well as giving the Aversarians motive to enslave and subjugate all men unlike themselves by divine right. The empire, though nearly indomitable from without, was bloody and brutal from within. At the death of an autocratier, magi would debate and fight each other in blood senates, duels which would decide the next emperor. Civil wars were commonplace and often made in an attempt to end the bloodlust of the magic demigod rulers, but the magi always won and the empire always grew, though not everywhere. These next few pages detail the other important peoples of the world, which I will try to summarize to the best of my ability. The martyrs of Shivali were descended from slaves who fled the empire and formed their own kingdom, whereupon they discovered ancient machines which could block magic that surrounded their lands, though they did not understand their function. They would come to be the main opposition of the Lich Kings, people who learn to trap their souls in undead bodies with great and terrible magic, who seek to consume life and magic in pursuit of ultimate power. The Shivali would come to be known for their skill in combating magic and would become famed mercenaries throughout the continent. In the south, in a land known as Ceridon, people known as the Ritualists worshipped one of Arsenon's ancient towers, which they themselves discovered surrounded by strange stones and steps, though none know their origin. This faith, like so many others, would fracture and form new cultures that battled with great empires to the west, known as the Chemosri. Thousands of years of strife and war would burden both these peoples, with the Chemosri falling to slave rebellions to a people who became known as the Amsari, 
who worshipped a prophet who foretold he could see the end of the world. In the east, in the lands dominated by scholars and a growing empire known as the Kathun Kai came the Olentic, remember them, who followed a ruler wielding a sword of terrible power, whose brief realm would subsequently collapse and whose people would come to populate the steppe land now known as Aronoi. What follows is several dozen conflicts with kings, magi, and their lands rising and falling. I won't detail it because you can find much more about it on the official discord, just know that the period of these conflicts was caused by a bunch of power-hungry magi of all types and became known as the chaos of the 7th century. Its end and the founding of the magi academies called the Maik Prololan will have importance later. Now all this external and internal strife and adversaria eventually gave rise to public discontent, shocker, and the people would rise against the autocratiers and the magi in an event known as the Agionist Rebellions, led by the Eight Saints, figures who represented their desired virtues and reforms that formed the basis of the rebellion. These saints were Catharitos the Philosopher, who believed hard work and kindness would allow humanity to reach perfection or enlightenment, basically. Eos the Knight, who called for bravery and protecting the weak. Legon Sancia, the Beautiful and Brilliant, who called for self-sacrifice. Pirate Captain Callisto, who wished to end slavery and have freedom for all. Thesia the healer, who wanted to advance medicine and give it to all, regardless of social standing. Philanthros the preacher, who called for charity and generosity. Dekainos, greatest lawman in Aversari history, who called for justice and equality. And last, the forgotten saint, who none now remember the name of, but preached humility and an end to the autocratier. Each of the saints chafed at the idea of being exalted or worshipped, but their followers would, of course, slide further into idolatry and fanaticism, until eventually they murdered the children of autocratier Francis, and themselves were brutally purged in the aftermath. Some reforms came, but only just, and Aversaria largely continued as a brutal and malicious as it was before the saints. The Agionis were expelled to the south in Ceridon, where their descendants would become crusaders and fall to the greed that seemingly plagues those who come to the sands. At the same time in Ceridon, the many cultured and wearing magi discovered ancient Elphir self-replicating blood magic, which devastated the land and killed thousands as the Magi struggled to control their new power. The Aversari and the Chevalians took note of this, and both would come, the Aversari to seek the ancient power that rested beneath the sands, and the Chevalians for riches and exotic goods. Pretty based. Aversaria, despite being a rumbling monstrosity of civil unrest, economic turmoil, and political incomprehension carried on, a leviathan of chaotic power and lust, which seemed to only sustain itself on what it could consume and subjugate. Still, they overextended, and tribes of barbaric men known as the Selvoki and their petty king warlords from the northeast began testing the empire's borders. That'll be important later. This next part is going to sound like I'm jumping ahead, but to explain the event, I need to explain the phenomenon first. In the world of Eris, since the death of its god, there is a phenomenon known as the Gedertha, which scholars believe to be the death or dream shutters of Ersanon. These are a great force of change and calamity whenever they occur, either causing something as small as a city to cease to exist or entire continents to shift and kill millions. The worst of such to occur in this age of the Empire was known as Ordstund, which ravaged the magical adversarian nobility and twisted their worst traits, making the cruel sadistic or the cynical psychopathic. Every minor offense was met with brutal destruction and the Empire fell unto itself, yet, as it had always done, endured for a time longer. Of those born during Ordstun's devastation, and I should mention that Ordstun is just over the course of a single night. All Gedertha are like this. They don't happen over weeks or months. It's just one day. But the results of which are permanent was Ashrace, the son of a powerful noble who, after his father had killed his sister Arias in drunken fury, released a magical torrent born of rage which destroyed his father and an entire palace city. Though a youth, he almost overnight became the strongest magi of his generation. As the world looked on at the young man wondering the kind of person he would become, they had no way of knowing it would be Ashrace who would bring about the end of the world. After the death of his father, Ashrace fled to the Magi Academy of Maik Prololan, or Maik Kratir, as the individual one is sometimes called. For the sake of this video, I'll be calling it the Maik Prololan, because we only ever focus on the one in the lore doc, and it's confusing trying to switch between names, because sometimes I might be referring to them as a group, and sometimes as the individual place, and it's just too much. Although technically there were thousands of smaller academies named the same thing, the main or most prestigious three sat within Kalathipsomi, the largest of which rested upon ancient ruins, and whose labyrinthine halls and monument rooms defied all logic and pushed the boundaries of mortal possibility with many students vanishing in its halls, never to be seen again. This can be seen on the top left of the game map. It was the one Ashrace went to. From Mike Prololan, the Magi had long attempted to influence the outside world, using those who would rule and manipulate them for their own purpose. 
Therefore, when Ace Race arrived, they quickly began working on him in hopes of making him a puppet to be used later for their own designs. At the same time, another student, a girl named Axiothea, was also under the influence of the Magi, a second daughter of Aranoi governor named Metricon, a man who felt little love for his daughter and wished to be rid of her. Metricon had Axiothea married to a known abusive Magi named Lithoxos. Long story short, Axiothea slew her Magi husband, literally ripping his skeleton from his body and most of his personal guard in a fit of rage after a month locked in a tower once he discovered her magical abilities at their wedding when Axiothea suddenly killed a few guests due to her frustration at having to marry him. Though her family tried to locate her, like Aishrae, she fled to Maik Prololan where she became the Magi's ward and again, potential political tool. Eris' destruction became certain when the two students were placed as pupils under the same teacher, Peltra an acclaimed but abusive woman and magister who beat her students when they failed to do as she wished, but comforted and loved them when they succeeded. Under the yoke of the renowned taskmaster, Axiothea and Aishrace found solace in one another, each seemingly understanding the power and loneliness of the other. But as the power of the two grew evident, they being the two most powerful students the school had ever seen, Peltra sought to push the two away from one another, to form a rivalry, and to rid them of their weak friendship to further enhance their abilities. Though the two's friendship would not falter, at least for now, they were constantly pitted against each other and the other students by the council of Maik Prolon in hopes of bringing out their full potential. Two dozen students and some instructors died in such competitions, and when Peltra demanded the two fight one another and had the other students in their class of ten attack the pair, an entire wing of the school was destroyed in their defensive retaliation, killing over a hundred students and instructors. The school, grabbing the pair as they collapsed, with exhaustion from their efforts, tortured the two in isolation in one last attempt to get them to turn on each other. And after years of this, the two relented under the condition they would not be held back by the instructors or council and would be free to attack as they wished. For a time, the two were kept separate, returned to classroom work, and their skills monitored on a school leaderboard, which they would check regularly as they topped and replaced one another with whoever happened to be first being treated with preference by Peltra. For a time, the council was satisfied, though some wondered if the two were truly rivals, despite how feverish and without mercy they attacked one another, for in the quiet moments, the two would almost be mistaken for friends. But the council could see that they could not make a puppet of one if the other continued to live. For their friendship or rivalry, it mattered little, kept pushing the two forward out of their grasp. Peltra, legendary magi, magister of the Maik Prololan, adventurer and once personal bodyguard to an autocratia, could not and would not risk her reputation with failure to bring one to heal. Therefore, when the pair would complete their final trials, they would perform a duel to the death, the winner becoming a magister, and the loser fading into obscurity, buried under a pile of political propaganda. As the students began their month-long trial, of whose tests they easily passed and broke long-held records in, they were eventually led to the tournament ground, where the council explained that they would have to fight to the death. What followed was pure chaos. For six hours, the pair dueled, and what seats had been constructed for observers and teachers were all but wiped out of existence killing all too close to the fight. In the end, the exhausted Axiothea and Aishrae stood alive, but bleeding to death as magic steam poured from their wounds and shrouded them in a gory mist. The surrounding area was a smoking ruin, deemed by the council untouchable due to the residual magic there for decades afterwards. The final events of the duel are the most heavily recorded, but in essence, Aishrae was the first to fall, but only to his knees, and then the pair spoke as old friends laughing and smiling. But Peltra and the council, who had protected themselves from the destruction by assembling bunkers of stone around their bodies, could see plain that they were not not the resigned smiles of old friends, but of wolves, and she demanded Axiothea finish the deed. And though Aishrae seemingly nodded his assent, Axiothea fired a shot at Peltra, who only warded it off by a hair, and retaliated with a magical blade that pierced Axiothea's stomach. But it was not enough to kill the girl, and with her second shot she slew Peltra, who exploded from the spell's unimaginable electric force. Then Axiothea covered the grounds in fire save for where Aishrae lay, and used the destruction to demand the council change the rules of the competition, that whoever collapsed would lose, but that their fellow pupil would not have to die. When the council assented, Axiothea collapsed to the ground, followed by Aishrae a few moments later. He, by his fellow pupil's demands, had become Magister. Axiothea was banished from the school, though many considered her the true winner, and back to her family before she awoke. Aishrae too departed, choosing to return home and join the most prestigious legion of Adversaria with the aid of his family. State Legio 21, Anisimasios, or the Autocratier's own. Within a year, Aishrace was made Legum, or head of the Legion, and yet despite his strength and prowess, many still came to criticize him for his victory on a technicality, with even his own men calling him Aishrace II behind his back. On the other side of the Empire, as Axiothea was still wounded and recovering from the duel, her father found a convenient way to not only help the recently declared wife-seeking Autocratier Anisimasios end the East-West Divide, but rid his household of the recent arrival of his fearful daughter. 
by marrying her to the emperor. A grand wedding was followed by a year of celebration, and the people of Aversaria cheered the pair, who they believed would forge a golden age of imperial revival. Anisimasios took on the name Kindblood for his generosity during these festivities by the peasants, and even the nobility relished the idea of a more prosperous future under his and Axiothea's rule. With this rare noble backing, Anisimasios sought sweeping reforms to the empire, to include its complex laws, the school of magi, how it handled its many faiths, and many, many tax reforms. To the surprise of many, Axiothea took to her role as empress, and while at first she was openly hostile to her husband, did all within her power to support him politically, and eventually the two grew to have a mutual respect and affection. As for Aishrace, with his own power and prestige were in constant flux. While his legion disrespected him, Anisimasios valued his connection to the noble families of his land and his magic insight, but would often skip over him in favor of his older family members. Some suspect this was done at the behest of Axiothea, who, although perhaps not totally maliciously, directly contributed to Aishrace not being named Archlega on four Katradian legions in a conflict against a rebel warlord. However, this supposed rivalry, at least at this stage, doesn't really hold water when one considers the pair's letters, which, if anything, show the two shared a deep respect, if not still a friendship as they had in days of old. The the empire seemed poised to prosper, but alas, it was not meant to be. For Nisimasios, at a festival celebration in which both Aishrace and Axiothea were in attendance, and just after announcing that Aishrace and his legion would lead the next assault on the rebels in the Eastern Empire, died after toasting to Aishrace with a glass of blood wine, becoming one of 15 emperors assassinated in the empire within the last century. Blood rushed from his lips as the room erupted with chaotic panic. Both Aishrace and Axiothea were among the first to go to the dead emperor's side, with Aishrace proclaiming the cup had been poisoned. Aishrace then placed the city under martial law with the aid of his legion under the pretext of preventing any escapees, but the goblet, which had poisoned the autocratir, was never seen again, causing many to speculate that it was Aishrace himself who had poisoned Amnisimasios. In the days that followed, Aishrace and Axiothea had their final public conversation together before he and his legion departed to Oreispol. Though none of his reforms came to fruition, the people of Aversaria mourned for Anisimasios and declared him a hero. Speculation and accusations flew all around the realm, with many people proudly and falsely declaring that they they were the ones to kill him from the smallest magi to the biggest warlords. But more than any one person, the eyes of the people and nobility fell on Axiothea, who, never shy about her desire for power, was accused of everything from wishing to usurp the throne for herself or her father in the east, to having killed the autocrat here at the behest of the Maik Prololan, or even harder to imagine, having plotted to kill him so she could marry her old rival Aishrace and give him control of the empire. For, as most pointed out, was it not she who handed Anisimasios the disappeared but allegedly poisoned chalice? Though she protested, it was Aishrace himself who used the convenient opportunity to position himself to fill the power vacuum, and as the dust settled on the political mudslinging, the east and west were firmly divided, with one supporting Axiothea and the other Aishrace. When the autocrat here's blood senate began, Axiothea entered her herself in the running, despite her father sending her sister, Methenia, as her selection, requesting to banish Axiothea from their dynasty, which kind of proves that she couldn't have killed Anisimasios at his behest, but whatever. Some 200 people survived or did not withdraw from the initial rounds of politicking, and at the magical tournament, Axiothea would face off against her sister, Methenia, while the heads of virtually every major family watched on. All would be killed as the blast which Axiothea unleashed upon her sister leveled the entire tournament ground to ash, the glow of which was seen halfway across the world. In a single attack, she had won the Blood Senate and cemented herself as the strongest adversarian mage in history, but also sparking a terrible civil war with Aishrace declaring himself the autocratier in the West, claiming she was nothing more than a murderer. And thus, Axiothea proclaimed herself autocratia in the East. In the ensuing 14-year war, which would ultimately destroy the empire, would become known as the Imperial Civil War. As the war raged, many peoples from the borders of Aversaria entertained the possibility of freedom or taking some of the lands in the ensuing chaos. None of these were more feared by the Aversarians than the Sialvoki, which we mentioned once before, a tribal culture descended from the men who slew Arsenon and who worshipped a faith that, unknown to them, was centered around the god Herja, a warlike and honorable people who hunted great beasts as part of their faith and revered magi but kept them at a cautious distance from their homes. These people were culturally divided by north and south, those in the north being traditionalists and the south being more pragmatic and worldly, but neither were soft as they each housed warriors that rivaled any in Aversaria and would often lead fearsome and devastating raids into those lands long before the Imperial Civil War. In the chaos that followed as Aversaria tried to battle forces within and without, the Sialvoki smashed all legions who came to stop them and devastated the empire for glory and land. After years of war, neither Aishrace or Axiothea were any closer to finishing the conflict, but their brutality earned them nicknames like Blood Autocratier for Aishrace and Magi of Blades for Axiothea. Aishrace was a political player during the Civil War and 
kept an extremely taut and intricate web of personal alliances and rivalries to keep his coalition together and under him, while Axiothea was famous for her abilities with a sword and for getting directly into the fighting on the battlefield. I feel it's important to distinguish that between these two because we can often lose sight of their character when looking at them from this, you know, top-down perspective, but Axiothea was actually quite a fierce warrior, and Aishra is quite shrewd despite, you know, seeming like he would just be slinging his magic or whatever. As desperation set in and the realm fell to ruins around them, the pair sent explorers and scholars to comb the farthest reaches of known lore and to bring back magics which they used to change Adversaria from the strongest economic and military might in the world to a wasteland, where thus far half the population had died in the struggle. In the end, the pair turned to self-replicating blood magic, the same which the Magi of Ceridon had destroyed themselves with so long ago. Before the war, Aishrace had formed a family, had a loving wife, and had several children, the oldest of which was a young girl named Arius, named for his murdered sister, who he loved and cherished. It was these people, who he held above all others, that he sacrificed to perform his final desperate attack. There, alongside two dozen of his strongest magi, they aimed the blast east. The year was 1200 IS when the end of the world began, for Fraud Brokna had begun. The magical attack destroyed Axiothea and her entire court in an instant, but as Aishrais and his magi attempted to bring the spell under their control and end it, they realized with horror that they could not. The magi began to burst into flames, crumbling to ash under the weight of the spell's growing power. The unbridled spell ravaged Aversaria and the lands surrounding it, killing half of the remaining empire's population and causing such a magical disturbance that even the dead god Ersanon stirred opening one of their great eyes which looked down blindly towards the world in an event forever known as Frobrokna, a Gadertha unlike any that had happened since the time of their death. Elvar cracked and shattered. Entire nations and continents crumbled and were swallowed by Eris' shifting plates. Waylines around the world erupted and millions died. But, worst of all, in the death stirring of the dead god, a great rift opened and from it poured eons of death and memory. At its location near the Maik Prolonin, a fog rushed forth. Those who found themselves within the fog were overcome with madness, or the manifestations of pure dread in the form of horrible atrocities and beasts which, in the wake of their slayings, remain in Eris as fog beasts, shambling hordes of unimaginable horror. Others simply withered away into nothingness, their life force consumed by the fog. Of those who were spared and lived still in the fog we know little, but the whispers of the fog have made them little more than raving madmen in the eyes of scholars. All who die on Eris are doomed to join the fog, for it is the personification of Eris's deathly thoughts. It is a land of ethereal cities and haunting redundance, of ghostly wars fought for eternity, of madness personified in an ever-crawling and expanding dread made reality. Perhaps needless to say, but Aversaria was doomed, and the world with it. As the fog rolled onward, some years only progressing a few feet, others consuming kingdoms overnight, the loss of land would force a great migration from all around, which would be the final nail in Aversaria's coffin. In the fog-swallowed lands of the north, the Sjalvoki ran, and for decades, former Aversarians, Sjalvoki, and countless others fled the crawling doom. One Aversari governor, Iolden, who was married to Sjalvoki, managed to resist these fleeing hordes and keep his kingdom together as a petty warlord, which would happen to most of the other lands later on. With the combined might of the Katradia's last legions, he formed a cohesive force to stand against the fog and barbarians alike. Yet all was not gloom and desperation, for from the north came too the greatest of the Sjalvoki, Senwar. He who spoke twelve languages, loved poetry, and was the greatest warrior his people had ever known. He who was as just and kind as he was calculating and vengeful who was as dignified and diplomatic as he could be cunning. He who would build what would come after Aversaria, the father of a new age and uniter of the Sjalvoki under a single banner for the first time in their history. He who had made a pact with the leaders of the tribes, promising that their union would not be one of bondage but of cooperation, and that they would be free to settle and have their own lands under this loose confederation known as the Sjalvoki in Perak. With magi from the Partic clan, the strongest left in all the world, and druids of the forest, Senwar and his people battled Iolden and slew him with his son Nicononius succeeding him. Nicononius declared himself Governor Arch Legon, seeing as he controlled the last of many scattered legions. Born after Fraud Brokna, he had been a warrior since prepubescence and would take up his father's banner and battle several more times with Senwar until he was defeated at the Battle of Grey Gate, where they were forced to retreat to their home of Kalathipsomi across the fog, which would reduce his force of nearly 100,000 to less than 10,000. For 30 years, Aishrace maintained power of a loose empire, but over time this power was tested from within and without by Axiothea loyalists, until finally, after an attack on Oriaspol, Aishrace's power was kicked out from under him, plunging what remaining realm he had into chaos and anarchy. In the north, with the aid of his fog magic-wielding druids, Senwar did the impossible, and traversed the fog to a the Maik Prololan and the Magi therein, 
his warriors scaling the school's mountainous base to reach its forbidden halls. Senwar freed the thousands of slaves therein, allowing his magi to take the knowledge they wished and slew what dissident magi they could find. Although it should be noted that they didn't take everything and they didn't slay everyone, which is why there are still some people left in the Mayak Pro Lull unit. They basically sacked this and then people have been continuously sacking it. So keep that in mind. They're, not everybody is dead. They just killed a lot of people and devastated the place. Think of it like a smash and grab. It was then, as the first person to ever sack Mayak Pro Lolan, that his people declared Senwar Witchbreaker. And with the aid of his newly bolstered magi who carried with them every conceivable magic magical weapon left in broken Aversaria marched south to battle once more with the broken legions and Nicononius, who after several losses would hand Senwar his only loss at the battle of Berg Koga. But Senwar would recover and drive Nicononius back into the Black Mountains. From there, Nicononius set to fight the Chevalians in the west, but would be pushed back to the mountains once again and defigured by a magi with fire in the last of those battles. Yet Nicononius was no fool and saw opportunity in his disfigurement, having forged a glass mask and armor in the old colors of Aversaria black, gold, and red, he proclaimed that he had been born on the day of an eclipse and that the purist himself had handed him to his family personally as his chosen envoy to rule the people of Aversaria. Thus, Nicononius adopted the nickname the Black Sun, and despite his countless defeats, declared he would stop at nothing to destroy the Sialvoki forever. What many consider the final death of Aversaria happened at the Battle of Elysian Pass, where Senwar's magi, using their control over the fog, devastated the remaining Aversari legions and opened the way to their great migration into the heart of the broken and dead empire. Senwar, it is said, did not celebrate, but rather penned a melancholic poem for the empire's fall in the days that followed. Of the few noteworthy survivors of that battle were René, the black bastard de Vassignon, a marcher mercenary captain and son of the former High King Godfrey, who managed to lead his people out of the chaos. Senwar is said to have saluted René for this effort and claimed him and his soldiers to be the only men he fought that day. When René returned home to Chevalier, a land long shattered and embroiled in conflict after the departure of their High King, René swore to reunite the realm and become the next High King. In the south, where the former Chevalier marchers thrived as merchants and selsards, the great Saradon general Hartha declared it was time for the Wardenites, an offshoot religion of the Ritualists, to fight back against the Agionist orders that plague their land. His master, Mamur Adabin, advised caution and to wait for the opportune moment to strike, but when the Agionist order of St. Callisto's Key captured and placed Hartha's wife in subjugation, he gathered his men together to strike back, but he was defeated by the order and discovered to his dismay that his wife had been killed. Killed. The Agionis then tossed the defeated and barely alive Hartha into the sea to die. But to their misfortune, he survived and washed ashore in the south, where, while fleeing imperialists and Agionis found nomadic tribes, masters of strange music and power. With his pledge to return their former lands to them, he and the desert people marched and retook southern Saradon from Aversaria and Agionist alike. Hartha then declared himself Hartha ibn Saradon, father of the south. Though he has promised to return all of Saradon to his people and eliminate the Agionist orders forever, the question remains, who controls the Agionist? For though the order of the forgotten saint is said to pull the strings of all orders, some suspect darker figures lurk in deep shadows. Thus, we reach the end of the war document. The year is 1254 IS. The principal conflicts are laid out for the most part, and the key players, again, for the most part, are named. Although, of course, some bigger figures were and are obscured in the lore doc as they aren't necessarily relevant to the overall story, the thing to remember as you browse the playable characters and numerous pretend autocrat here vying for power over a broken empire is that there's plenty of room for you in this world, too. All you need to do is enter. Still, the question now remains, what will become of this new post-Aversarian world? Will Senwar and his people continue their expansion and build a new, better future for humanity? Will Hatha ibn Saradon defeat the Agionis Crusaders and banish them once and for all from his land? Will Rene succeed in his mission to become the next High King and reunite the Chevalian Marchers? Will Nicononius deliver on his promise to destroy the Sialvoki? What of Aishrace? Surely something lingers deep in the mind of the most powerful man left in Eris, perhaps the rightful autocrat here of a lost empire. Or perhaps it doesn't matter. Perhaps the fog whose seemingly endless march will continue. What happens before and after is not for me to say, but rather for you to discover for yourselves. I wish you well, and pray you survive in this harsh world, for the future of humanity surely depends on it. Thank you so much for watching. I want to give a special thanks to Lonely Knight S and all the developers of God Herja. This video would literally not exist without you. I only hope I did it justice. Remember that this, as dense and detailed as it was, was only a taste of the 74-page lore document, which is itself just a taste of the deeper lore and stories being crafted by the stellar team. Make sure to check out the God Herja Reddit and Discord, both linked alongside the mod itself below. I will also, as I said before, be including my notes in their entirety, which will include page numbers and a link to the lore document for your reading pleasure. I also pulled a ton of art from literally everywhere with zero foresight that I should probably cite it, so if you see something you or someone you know made, please let me know and I'll update the description with your credit. Aside from artist Kim Diaz-Holm, who provides his art for free for all, his work appeared throughout 
about the video. I just want to lay that out there because I might forget to put it in the description. If you like this video, make sure you like, comment, subscribe as it lets me and YouTube know that you like the video and like to see more. This was perhaps my most ambitious lore document to date, or lore video, I guess, to date. So your support would mean a whole lot. If you enjoy my content, consider becoming a channel member or joining our community Discord. Links for both are provided below. I would also like to point out, uh, as we're here at the end of the video, that the devs actually uh, graciously offered to help me revise this uh, last draft, or I guess my original final draft. And then they offered to put me in the game as a character who you can see um, at some point. I don't know if he's available yet, but I've seen little models of him and you can see that right here. And it's very cute, and I like it, and I hope you play as me, and then you can uh, die horribly like I do every time I play this game. You can also have a character made of yourself if you support them on the Patreon, which I provided a link for in the description. But that's going to be it for me. Thank you again for watching. I'm Sol. This has been a God Herja lore video, hopefully the God Herja lore video, and I will happily see you in the next one.